Well, good morning, friends, to those of you in the room and to those of us that are also joining us online, and a very special welcome to some of our special guests and dear friends of mine, members of the Global Board of the Galilean Movement, an organization that equips disciple-making leaders around the world. Would you please either stand or wave when I call your name? Dr. Manfred Cole, who serves as the chairman, would you please join me in greeting my dear brother? Uh, Bishop F., who serves as the executive director. Uh, Joe Handley, who is also the president of A3. And the most recent board member that has joined the Galilean Movement, Colin Miller. Colin, glad to have you as well. Uh, good to see you as well. Other individuals that are serving, our own Ramesh Richard and our own Michael Ortiz. We clap for you all of the time, so we won't do that anymore. We are so thankful that you have chosen to spend today with us. As president, I am especially grateful to be here celebrating the seminary's 100th year anniversary. As we celebrate God's faithfulness in this centennial year, I can't help but think of how blessed our school is to have such a strong legacy. Whenever you acknowledge your heritage, your eyes are open to a greater appreciation for the present, and your hope is broadened for what is to come in the future. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, a man of great vision and an even greater faith, a man who lived and loved his studies but loved people even more, a well-known Bible teacher and conference speaker. He's written many books such as True Evangelism, and he that is spiritual. He is most profoundly known for his work in systematic theology, including authoring an eight-volume series on the topic. You and I stand here today because of the labor of this man. You and I stand here today because of the foundation this man paved for us to walk on. I'd like to introduce you to the founder and first president of Dallas Theological Seminary, Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer. Join me today as we go through the chapters of his life as a loyal servant to our Lord. Chapter 1, Chafer's Childhood and Early Ministry. Born of Reverend Thomas Franklin Chafer, and Lois Lomira Sperry on February 27, 1871, in a little town called Rock Creek, Ohio. In the quaint tranquility of a warm and devout household nestled in the embrace of Christian tradition, Lewis Sperry Chafer entered the world as the third child. His childhood unfolded within the walls of a cozy parsonage where the essence of faith permeated the air. Amidst this nurturing environment, at the tender age of six, Lewis found himself seated upon his father's knee, enveloped in the gentle glow of familial love. It was here, in the sanctum of their home, that he encountered Christ for the first time. Within the pastoral care of his father's first pastorate in Rock Creek, Chafer encountered the Lord and received the free gift of salvation. At the age of 10, Amidst the humble simplicity of their family's life, Lewis Sperry Chafer received a precious gift from his father that would shape his life profoundly. His father bought his sister Etta a piano, his brother Rollin a violin, and an old brass cornet for Lewis. This gesture of paternal love not only brought joy to their home, but also ignited within Lewis a lifelong passion for music. Shortly after receiving these gifts, tragedy struck the Chafer family when Lewis's father, Thomas Franklin Chafer, passed away from tuberculosis when Lewis was just 11 years old. To support her children, Lewis's mother began teaching at a school and taking in boarders. Lewis attended Rock Creek Public School before completing his secondary education at the New Lyme Institute. It was at the Institute where his passion for literature and music flourished. 
It was also here that Schaefer would hear a transformative message from an evangelist called Mr. Scott, a message about the grace of God. This encounter gave Lewis a deep religious zeal and commitment. Schaefer claimed that after listening to Scott, that he had given him a message for life, the message of God's amazing grace. Later, the Chafer family would settle in Oberlin, with Lomira managing a boarding house at the school that allowed her children to study at Oberlin College. Lewis immersed himself in music studies at the Warner Hall Music Conservatory, where he excelled at piano and cornet. While he loved to study music, he often found himself distracted as his heart desired a different form of study. Ms. Ella Lorraine Case. She moved to Ohio from Ellington, New York to also study music at the Oberlin Music Conservatory. As Ms. Case's musical talents blossomed, Lewis Sperry Chafer's admiration for her deepened. Her proficiency as a pianist and organist captivated him, nurturing the growth of his affection for her. At times, he would occasionally catch himself daydreaming of printing business cards with the lines, Lewis Chafer, baritone soloist, Mrs. L.S. Chafer, accompanist. Their romance, which began in 1891, flourished over the years, culminating in their engagement in 1894. In 1896, Lewis Sperry Chafer and Ella Lorraine Case joyfully exchanged vows, sealing their commitment to each other in marriage. During this period, Lewis Sperry Chafer joined forces with Congregational Evangelist Arthur T. Reed after being inspired by Reed's ministry. Chafer asked to partner with Reed as a singing evangelist, and together they hosted 58 revival meetings from 1890 to 1896, ranging from several days to several weeks each. In time, Lewis Sperry Chafer's ministry path evolved into establishing a full-time evangelistic ministry with his wife, which seamlessly integrated music and preaching. Along this journey, he became immersed in the burgeoning Bible conference movement, collaborating closely with influential figures like W.H. Griffith Thomas and C.I. Schofield. As his fervor for the scriptures deepened, so did his bond with Schofield forging a relationship that would profoundly shape Chafer's spiritual journey. Lewis Sperry Chafer's ministry path led him to teach under the mentorship of C.I. Schofield. After Schofield's passing, Chafer assumed the pastorate of Schofield Memorial Church and became involved with the Central American Mission, founded by Schofield. Across his multifaceted ministry journey as an evangelist, Bible conference speaker, teacher, pastor and author, Lewis Sperry Chafer never forgot his abiding love for music. Amidst the myriad of responsibilities he had, he found solace and joy in composing hymns, a heartfelt expression of his devotion. Amongst his compositions, When You Have Found a Savior emerged as his most renowned hymn. Its timeless message resonated deeply with believers earning a place in three different hymnals, where it continues to uplift and inspire hearts to this day. Throughout Lewis Berry Chafer's early ministry, the hand of the Lord was at work, shaping his character and equipping him for a monumental responsibility he could never have imagined on his own. It was during this formative period that God bestowed upon him a vision, one beyond his wildest dreams a vision for a new chapter in his life and our heritage. Just as Lewis Sperry Chafer traveled and taught songs of worship to others, today we will follow in his footsteps. Please stand as our music team teaches and leads us in singing the notable hymn, When You Have Found a Savior, written by none other than our very own Lewis Sperry Chafer. We would like to teach you the chorus 
of this song so we'll teach that then we'll ask you to sing along with us and then we will sing through this hymn when you have found the savior go forth and gladly tell the joyful news to others that they his praise may swell can you join us when you have found the savior go forth and gladly tell the joyful news to others that they his praise may swell verse one when you have found the savior and peace through him have known then straightway seek your brother and lead him to the throne when you have found the savior go forth and gladly tell the joyful news to others that they Praise may swell. Lead other souls to Jesus, He who your sins forgave, whose love you found so precious, and tell them He will save. When you have found the Savior, go forth. Tell the joyful news to others that they his praise may swell. Go bear the blessed tidings of his salvation free to all who may not know him that they. Savior, go forth and gladly tell the joyful news to others that they his praise may swell. Go tell when you have found him how gracious and how kind is Jesus your Redeemer and help them Him to find. When you have found the Savior, go forth and gladly tell the joyful news to others that they His praise may swell. When you found the Savior, go forth and gladly tell the joyful news to others that they His praise may Chapter 2 the founding of Dallas Seminary. In 1912, as an evangelist, Lewis Ferry Chafer delivered lectures at four colleges, including Davidson College and Columbia Theological Seminary. During these visits, he engaged students in discussions about their theological education and sought feedback on what they felt was lacking. He also conversed with pastors during his travels, asking them about their experiences with seminary education and what they wished they had received. The feedback was consistent. While they had learned extensively about topics related to the Bible, many felt they hadn't focused enough on studying the Bible itself. This underscored a clear need for action. During the modern era of the Bible movement, a surge of liberal theological perspectives permeated academia and numerous churches, marked by increasing rationalistic tendencies. 
While revisionists sought to preserve Christianity's relevance in a secular society, they did so by reinterpreting fundamental doctrines related to the mission of Christ, thereby distorting historic Christian orthodoxy. In response to this trend, some engaged in polemics as a means of counteraction. Lewis Sperry Chafer, however, took a proactive approach by establishing an institution dedicated to providing students with conservative, traditional theological training. His vision was to equip individuals with the tools to communicate scripture clearly in the face of these theological challenges. As Lewis Sperry Chafer felt God stirring in his heart, burdened for his generation, he joined his friends W. H. Griffith Thomas and A. B. Winchester in fervent prayer. Together, they urgently sought the Lord's guidance in establishing a school that would honor him. In 1924, their vision became a reality as Evangelical Theological College was established. Its primary aim was to offer conservative evangelical theological education with a focus on emphasizing a dispensational interpretation of Scripture. Evangelical Theological College prioritized expository preaching and comprehensive study of all 66 books of the Bible. Lewis Sperry Chafer envisioned it as a seminary for Bible teachers, aiming to equip students to effectively communicate Scripture in various roles, including the pastorate, missions, and leadership in Bible institutes. Chafer aimed to institutionalize the insights gleaned from the personal studies of the great teachers at Bible conferences. He noted this. In the last generation, these men have been properly called our Bible teachers, whether in England or Canada or the United States. Our Dallas College is founded by the best of these men in America who have the conviction that the kind of training they'd had to gain by personal and private study could be offered in regular classroom form. A school where every student and every faculty had one textbook in common, the Bible. A school where there was only one teacher, the Holy Spirit. In his teachings, Lewis Sperry Chafer particularly cherished delving into the spiritual life and the profound impact of grace, echoing the message that had shaped his own journey when he first heard it from Mr. Scott. He emphasized to his students the foundational truth of salvation by grace through faith, urging them to embrace it wholeheartedly. Life in Jesus was only available to us because of God's grace. While instruction was a vital aspect of Chafer's teaching, he also stressed the importance of worshiping through music, ensuring that his students never overlooked this essential expression of devotion. In 1936, Dr. Chafer formally renamed the seminary to Dallas Theological Seminary, an institution that would be forever marked by grace.
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I still remember many things he said. I'll never forget one class where he said, man, God is satisfied. You said skill. Man, God is satisfied. Man, God is satisfied. I went out of that class never forgetting a lot. He taught many things. Oh, when you trusted in Christ, all your sins, past, present, and future, were forgiven. Uh, if you haven't given the people something to believe, you haven't preached the gospel. He, he was a, a phrase maker, and he would say things that you would never forget when he said that. They were just excellent. So I found it a great privilege to have Dr. Kaper, even though he was an old man at the time I had. He was a great Christian. You know, as an educator, guys, the thing that really impressed me was uh, his teaching a class in the spiritual life, coming to the end of it. The place was absolutely transfixed. Going over, flipping the light, and walking out, and nobody moved. And I thought to myself, that's teaching. The next year, I followed you. you were, well, I told him to do that. Well, yeah, you were my older <laughs> So I followed you. And, and Chief was the same thing. Romans 6, 7, 8. Correct. And, and uh, nobody, but he, he turned the lights out. He, he wanted to save a penny. <laughs> and, and, uh, nobody budged. Just the, the impact of his teaching. Another experience uh, I had, I sat at his feet for five years, was in Christology, the soteriology. And redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, the finished work of Christ. He was never great in his teaching. Then when he was talking about the finished work of Christ, and I have, I, I've never forgotten that. It burned its way into my mind and into my heart. He was a man with, with uh, a very loving heart. He had a great sense of humor. Yeah, right. I even wrote down some of his jokes. I still have them. And they're funny. They're funny. They're funny. Uh, he loved the students. He and Mrs. Chaper did not have any children of their own. So he, he called all of his students his son. His son. And I remember when I heard that there was a vacancy in some large church up in the Moody Memorial Church, one of these great churches. He recommended a, a student who had just graduated. <laughs> he, he just felt that any graduate of Dallas seminaries could preach anywhere in the world. Including Westminster Abbey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I remember him also for his... Um, passion for souls, you know, how he could share the gospel and witness to people. And some of the stories he told of uh, sharing the gospel were just so natural yeah. and they were just great. I think. He was not only a man that was a tremendous Bible teacher, but an excellent, excellent evangelist as well. He was. He invited many of us out to his home on Friday night for sort of a discussion session. And uh, somebody went to get a drink of water and discovered there was nothing in his refrigerator. So we took up an offering and uh, he went out. You know, he lived near Island Park. Park. And we went out to Safeway and we bought some stuff and we put it in the refrigerator and in its closet. And next Tuesday he came to class and he said, you know, guys, it's incredible how God supplied to me. And tells us a story. Because <laughs> 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 you figure out what was so funny. <laughs> well, 
But I thought, you know, man, you talk about a guy teaching you. I mean, uh, he taught us more through that experience. Yeah. I know he believed in the angels because when I had him, he was very old. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he'd drive up to Davidson and he, he couldn't back up. He'd drive up <laughs> right next to the building to make a U-turn so he could drive yeah. back out again. And angels were protecting him as he drove. And well, I said, we said there was one on every fender. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Well, he drove all the way from Island Park yeah. to, the, to the seminary in first gear. Oh, yeah. The yeah. <laughs> students took up an offering. And bought him a new car, about 1940. And, uh, of course, standard transportation. Yeah. But he didn't ship. He didn't <laughs> put it on there. Oh, <laughs> uh, so you knew God's grace and you taught God's grace as well. You're right, though. He had a winsome, what I would call, yes. a winsome way of presenting the gospel. Yeah. And Stan, the teaching of God's grace was the thing of Florida. Yeah. Came out of a legalistic background. Same here. Really never knew. Yeah. yeah. The grace of God. And I can remember what's a freshman, single, coming out of that class and going up to 301 where I live and throwing myself across the bed saying, Lord, I can't take anymore. But I see like getting saved all over again. Yeah. yeah. Well, I came to Dallas yeah, Seminary. <laughs> yeah. 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 I came to Dallas Seminary not believing in eternal security. I didn't know about oh. security leader. And when he made that statement, when you trust in Jesus Christ, all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. I, I was a first year student. I never knew more than I did then. And I said, I said to myself, that's ridiculous. I can see how your past sins would be forgiven, how your present sins would be forgiven. But how could your future sins be forgiven? Then he said, now some of you may be wondering how your future sins can be forgiven. <laughs> you had you in mind. Yeah, that's right. And then, he, then he said, how many of your sins were future when Christ died on the cross? And it hit me like a ton of grief. Why he paid for all my sins. And that was a big turning point in my coming to the security of the Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. Very nice. We appreciate it. Where do we send the invoice? <laughs> <laughs>
The great love I have for each member of the first graduating class is not lessened at all by the new and equally precious love which I have for each member of the second and third classes. One of my sorrows is that I am so utterly unable to correspond with each student and to keep in that close understanding concerning all that is entering into your experience now that it was my privilege and joy to do while you were in the student body. This is in the form of an annual letter which, though personally written, is going to each one of our graduating students. First of all, we are most happy and encouraged by the reports that reach us of the fine work our graduates are now doing. Life is made up of days and hours and moments which never return again. Almost every preacher has had high ideals as to his own spiritual life and development, and about 100% utterly fail. Does this fact not mean much in the way of admonition to you? You know as well as I do just why they fail. They do not put first things first. They're always too busy with the secondary things to attend to the first things. You know the importance of your own life of prayer and study of the scriptures. And you have found out that it's easy to neglect these things. I desire so much that you may become a prayer warrior. That is one who demands much time each day for prayer. Every feature of God's service committed to you depends on this. Then your Bible study must be continued, not just working out the next sermon, but rather your own systematic work, which becomes through the years the body of truth from which you draw all your material. Our courses of study at the college anticipated a lifetime of study on the part of the student. What a calling we have from God. How great is our trust. I am sure that you will make a better fight than I have made and to demonstrate the mighty power of God in your life and service everywhere others have failed. Come home as often as you can. The college will welcome you with overflowing love, with sincere affection, I am as ever and forever yours in him, President Louis Sperry Chafer. Let me ask if you would stand, please, and join us in singing this great hymn, And Can It Be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain, for me who Him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be? That thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? He left his father's throne above, so free, so Himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless grace. Tis mercy all the men. 
Barry Chafer's older brother, Rollin Chafer, played a pivotal role in the founding of Dallas Theological Seminary. A Princeton-educated student, Rollin cherished the tradition of singing the diadem when students gathered, a practice initiated by Charles Hodge. Recognizing the seminary as a spiritual successor to Princeton in its rigor and heritage, Rollin shared this tradition with Lewis. In honor of Rollins' instrumental contributions to the seminary's establishment, we continue to this day singing our school song, The Diadem, in loving memory of his legacy. Let it. 
now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory unto his own exceeding joy be glory, majesty, dominion, and power forever and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit you portion by right and title be the experience of your heart until Jesus comes and every shadow flees away. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in thanking the Lord for a man named Lewis Sperry Chafer? Amen. A heartfelt thank you goes to everyone who contributed to the success of this chapel event. Our sincere gratitude extends to our dedicated media production and chaplain teams for their tireless efforts. Thank you. We are also deeply appreciative of our talented organist and trumpet player for their beautiful musical contributions. Special recognition goes to our gifted narrators for bringing Chafer's story to life with passion and skill. <laughs> Lastly, we extend a special thank you to Dr. John Hanna for his invaluable contribution in authoring An Uncommon Union, a resource that provided profound insights into the various chapters of Chafer's life. Your dedication and expertise, Dr. Hanna, have enriched our understanding and appreciation of this extraordinary individual. Well, in true birthday fashion, because today is Dr. Lewis Barry Chafer's birthday, please join us in the lobby as we enjoy cake and custom cookies from the Tasteful Cookie Company to celebrate Dr. Lewis Barry Chafer's birthday and this centennial year. As Chafer led an example, go now and lead the way in teaching truth and loving well. <laughs>